Konnichiwa. Good uh, afternoon, ladies uh, and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our conversation service. This is my eighth conversation service uh, ever since uh, I became director at the beginning of the year. And today I am delighted uh, to welcome uh, our USG, Ms. Izumi Nakamitsu, uh, who obviously needs no uh, introduction. And of course, uh, she has a, a very important responsibility of disarmament affairs globally. Uh, Ms. Nakamitsu previously served as assistant administrator of the crisis response unit at uh, UNDP and has many years of experience in the UN system. Uh, she has also previously worked as a professor of international relations at uh, Hito Tsubashi University in Tokyo, where she also served as a member of the Foreign Exchange Council to Japan's foreign minister. And as a visiting senior advisor on peace building at the Japan International Cooperation Agency. Welcome back to the United Nations University. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, one of the statements that I have learned ever since I came to Tokyo is the, is the statement, Tokyo wa kire desu ne. Tokyo wa kire desu ne? Really? <laughs> okay. Which means Tokyo, for those of you who do not understand Japanese, it means Tokyo is a very beautiful city. So thank you very much. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, in, uh, topic of, uh, of disarmament is, uh, is, is very close to my heart, uh, coming from the African continent, where we really have to silence the guns. Mm. Uh, it's really the responsibility of uh, certainly my generation to make sure that the guns are silenced. And of course, we know uh, just recently, the Secretary General presented his policy brief on new agenda for peace this July. Could you give us some background on the new agenda for peace? What are some of the recommendations that we need to note? I would imagine all of them. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's nice to be back to Japan, to Tokyo, but also to the UN University. Um, I know this institution very well. And uh, UNU has been always very, very kind to me and also in the context of making the, the you know, new agenda for peace, you have been a very important partner also to us in the Secretariat Office for Disarmament Affairs. So thank you, sort of multiple dimensions. Now, how much time do you have? I mean, it's a big issue, but let me just try to summarize, I mean, what is background, um, you know, which led us, led the Secretary General uh, to decide that we need a new agenda for peace. By the way, when there was an original agenda for peace under the Secretary General, then Secretary General Bhutto Scali, I was already with the United Nations. I was a young uh, officer at the time working for uh, UNHCR, and I was quite excited. That original agenda for peace was put together because the Cold War had just ended. There was a big paradigm shift um, the UN peace and security challenges were now in the post-Cold War period, very new. End of a big strategic conflict between the East and West, um, and, and that led to many, you know, resolution of many um, conflicts at the time, but that also triggered new types of conflicts, internal war, identity-based war, etc. So the UN at the time felt that we need an agenda for peace. So fast forward 30 plus years later, new agenda for peace. And you can imagine the big context, the background is that we are now going through a new paradigm shift, another paradigm shift, where the, the post-Cold War era is ending or has ended, and we're in the post-Post-Cold War era. Together with it, and I will explain some of the big sort of uh, um, challenges, the context, 
But together with that paradigm shift, the UN and the international community, we felt, the Secretary General felt, that we need new approaches tackling issues related to challenges related to international peace and security. Now, what's the environment? What's the big context? Um, number one, as you can see on the news every day, um, a new type of big um, competitions. Um, I hesitate to use the word great powers because great has a value definition. <laughs> I always call them big military powers. There was a, a you know, tension, competition, rivalry between those big military powers that is now really impacting international uh, security, strategic stability. It's not really like the previous Cold War where there was two bipolar, you know, two big you know, uh, states. It's much more complicated. They are multipolar centers of power, the military uh, capabilities. Uh, also, at the different regional levels, there are old and new conflicts, uh, which also tends to take place against the background of nuclear tones. I mean, this region included also the North, um, North Korea issues. So generally speaking, international peace, is, peace context is much more complicated and, and we are approaching a, a big sort of a, a dangerous, risky uh, era. Um, so that's number one. And in that context, major nuclear powers are all investing massive amount of money into modernizing and improving nuclear weapons. Um, all these trends have started to take place, of course, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, but definitely the Ukraine uh, war has now exacerbated all these tensions. So we are really living in a very dangerous uh, period. At the same time, international norms, um, international law, various agreements that held together uh, the stability is eroding. Mm -hmm. One big uh, area, of course, is my area of disarmament. Disarmament really is about international security. It's not a utopian ideals, but it's various you know, instruments put together as a regime to make sure that those uh, values, norms, international agreements will contribute to stability and security. That is eroding. And that is also happening against the background of new technologies developing at massive amount of uh, uh, speed, massive speed, um, you know, cyber um, technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, very important. Um, and, and we now have two do new domains, cyber domains and outer space domains that have a, a really important uh, um, um, role to play potentially uh, also in the areas of um, international conflict as well. So all these things are, are really uh, put together. You can see that we need to have new approaches, mm -hmm. new vision, how we make sure that we will protect the norms that we have been building for the past few centuries, um, but especially in the post-Cold War area era uh, disarmament agreements, we need to protect them, maintain them, uh, but at the same time we build on them and where the norms and governance structures are not sufficient, such as in the new technology and new domains area, we need to have new norms and, and regulations uh, agreed upon. So that's why we needed to have a new vision for um, um, disarmament that is placed at the center of New Agenda for Peace. New Agenda for Peace is everything, peace and security, so it includes preventative diplomacy, um, peacekeeping operations, various types of peace building efforts, disarmament at the center. Action, there are 12 actions, which starts with action number one is about strategic issues and that's about disarmament. It starts with the nuclear area. Um, and um, Another new dimension is that those peace and security challenges are really um, integrated fully into various other challenges of international community, such as sustainable development, development goals, human rights, more human-centered approach. We need to make sure that security 
various security measures and, and actions that we take would directly um, um, benefit the, the development, sustainable development goals uh, as well. So, so but, uh, but we are also seeing that there is uh, an, in, an increasing military spending. Yes. Is there anybody, <coughs> uh, is anybody listening to many of these strategies? How do we make sure that we enforce uh, international norms? Well, unfortunately, I think it would be very difficult to enforce. But as you say, this issue, this is actually a charter vision. The United Nations Charter demands that there will be a minimum military spending uh, so that it would not impact um, other areas of um, um, you know, priority economic developments, etc. So it's an old vision that uh, the founders of the UN had already um, you know, thought about. Unfortunately, we are going the wrong direction. Last year in 2022, the military spending at the global level hit 2.24 trillion US dollars. Um, and you can imagine this, um, this is definitely, um, you know, on the one hand, this is a reflection of the current security environment. Many states feel that they are under threat and therefore they invest uh, in military. Um, what we try to argue in the new agenda for peace is that, of course, appropriate level of defense is, uh, um, you know, is a right um, uh, under international law, but um, not to the level of um, impacting other priorities. Mm. Let's not forget that we are also still um, coming through the COVID-19 mm. um, various um, economic um, challenges. We are also going through really uh, difficult climate um, challenge change. I mean, the Secretary General says now we are in a uh, time of a global boiling, <laughs> no longer uh, climate global warming, but it's, it's boiling. Um, I think uh, we have to make sure that other priority issues also will be um, addressed. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and so the, the, the new agenda for peace is calling for a reduction of military spending, but this is easy to say. Um, I think there will have to be a concrete uh, practical measures that we need to start implementing, one of which is how military spending actually impacts mm. Um, mm. development mm. And, and other issues. You know, the last time that the United Nations General Assembly um, requested the UN Secretariat to do an in-depth analysis on this was, I think, 1987 or 86. Um, since then, there have not been a serious analysis of the impact of um, excessive yeah. military spending. So we need to actually do a serious analysis. Um, and and um, that's something that uh, we would like to do, but we need to get a mandate from, from the UN members, member states. So if we come uh, to Japan, uh, what do you think is the role of Japan in preventative diplomacy? I think there are many things that Japan could do. Um, I want to say at the outset that when you say preventative diplomacy, uh, if the prevention is only seen as only a political measure of you know, subtle diplomacy, I think it might actually be already too late. Um, we need to do a more of a structural prevention efforts, mm -hmm. and that is really investing in development as well. So, you know, really um, upstream prevention measures, I think, uh, is uh, really key, which is why, again, in New Agenda for Peace, mm -hmm. we are arguing that various uh, development efforts um, will, you know, contribute to prevention, mm -hmm. but also disarmament and other peace and security measures will contribute to longer-term mm -hmm. sustainable development. So I have been actually casually referring to, I mean, I think member states, uh, many member states actually like this casual phrasing that I was using. Um, we need to developmentalize disarmament. I think disarmament has been seen in a, a sort of very separate silo, very much technical issues of discussing 
different sets of different categories of weapon systems. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is not the right approach. Um, upstream prevention measures through various efforts, including, and I would say very importantly, uh, development efforts will be uh, a very key um, efforts towards prevention. And I think Japan has many years of really good bottom-up mm -hmm. um, approaches uh, from that point of view. One of the key recommendations of the new Agenda for Peace is strengthening of peacekeeping operations. And of course, I come from South Africa, and uh, we have multiple UN peacekeeping missions. Uh, how do we strengthen and improve uh, the effectiveness of peacekeeping operations? And what do you think is the role of the African Union in this? Thank you for that question. You know, I, I was in peacekeeping for many years. So this is, um, you know, before UNDP, I, I was in DPKO. At the time, it was called Department of Peacekeeping Operations. So it's a very um, um, important issue. I think peacekeeping, peace operations in general, um, is at uh, um, a really important crossroads. Um, you know, when the UN Security Council um, is not functioning as, as effectively as mm -hmm. it used to, it's, it is difficult to, to, to foresee that there will be a robust new uh, types of uh, peacekeeping operations you know, created. Uh, quite the contrary, as, as we all know, um, peacekeeping operation in Mali is uh, phasing out. Um, so we are definitely at a very difficult phase in, in general in peacekeeping. Now, one of the challenges related to peacekeeping is um, what we might call a more enforcement-like military operations that are necessary. Those are the, the, the sort of operational theater that demands robust military um, peacekeeping operations. And I think for that, we need to have new thinking. And you asked about African Union. I think there will have to be definitely a much closer partnership with regional organizations and, and AU has a, a really good experiences in AMISOM and also in Darfur, uh, where we work together between the AU and the United Nations. The key, however, in that arrangement is to make sure that the financial resources under the regular budget, uh, you know, mobilized by the UN, and that is always made available in a pr predictable manner to African Union member states. Uh, so I think we, we still have a lot of work to do uh, in that regard. But the other aspect of peacekeeping is, of course, more of a, a peace-building type of mm -hmm. activities. And there, I think we need to make sure that um, closer cooperation and uh, technical expertise of various UN entities uh, will be much better utilized. Um, and, and so... You know, there are many things that we still need to do, but as, as I said uh, in the beginning, peacekeeping itself is also going through a very challenging time, um, and that is related to the functioning of the Security Council itself. Mm. And in your view, does gender play an important role in the power dynamics of peace and uh, security? Absolutely. And could disarmament strategies be more effective if more women were in leadership positions? I mean, I ask you, I think <laughs> if, if women are in charge, I don't think we are, you know, if we are in this uh, kind of a, a crisis state around mm -hmm. the world. No, definitely. Um, I mean, there is, um, uh, you know, empirical data that where women play a greater role, um, you know, peace is made more sustainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, for example, uh, ceasefire or peace agreement um, uh, actually lasts longer if women were at the table together, part of the negotiations. So there is, uh, you know, in-depth uh, and, and very rich research that is actually proving that uh, where women play a more prominent role, um, peace and security uh, is made much more sustainable. Now, in the disarmament field, disarmament is... Um, traditionally a very uh, male-dominated community, um, and, uh, and we want to change it, and we are changing it. Mm -hmm. 
um, and you know, it's one of the priority agenda of myself, but also my office, and also for the, the Secretary General. Um, the Secretary General has already uh, made his public commitment in 2018, specifically in disarmament field as well, um, you know, where when, when the authority is delegated to him to put together various bodies, like the group of governmental uh, experts, or creating um, you know, disarmament groups that would advise him. You know, wherever he is tasked to, to put together those mechanisms, he will definitely um, achieve um, um, gender parity, at a minimum near gender parity, and he has been fulfilling them. It's been difficult, but it has been possible, and where we have made sure that women are participating equally, they are actually, um, you know, uh, much more of, um, um, you know, perspectives reflected from um, women. Um, and I would say that the, the, the outcome has been uh, very um, um, substantive. Um, and I think um, I can safely announce that ODA itself, my um, uh, office within this year will achieve gender parity at all levels, so it's been very intense efforts, but we are making um, uh, good efforts. Just on this very practical um, example I want to share with you, um, cybersecurity, there is something called Open Ed Working Group, um, which was created by the, uh, the General Assembly, that is really having uh, dedicated discussions and negotiations amongst member states on cybersecurity related issues. Um, and this working group has the highest percentage of, compared to other multinational disarmament discussions. Um, about 40% of delegates that are coming from member states are women. And that is probably because we have made in early stages of this working group, we've invested a lot of opportunities to train female diplomats on these new issues. And as a result, there are now many more, I mean, compared to other issues like nuclear, bio, etc., cybersecurity discussions of more women. And um, many uh, experts say that as a result, the discussions actually has been very interesting. And, and you know, it's a difficult area, uh, but we are making um, progress uh, in this area. Over the last few years, we have seen a huge expansion of the use of artificial intelligence and autonomous weapons in conflict. What are your views on the weaponization of AI and other related technologies? And what impact does it have on disarmament? Huge impact. OK. Artificial intelligence and the use and application of AI in the military domain in general will probably change, change the, the, the landscape of war quite significantly. And the impact is still not very clear. Now, I want to make sure that AI applicability in the military domain will have positive impact as well. You know, many areas like logistics, supply chain management, analysis of intelligence, early warnings, etc. Those areas mm. will probably benefit. Also, verification, monitoring and verification, which is very important for disarmament, will benefit from the use of artificial intelligence. But at the same time, they are likely big negative mm. impact, mm. which is also still at this stage unpredictable. An example, if artificial intelligence were to be applied and used in nuclear weapons command and control systems, um, the impact will be probably very negative. Um, on the one hand, um, there is um, you know, much shorter compressed uh, time for decision making. Mm. So whether you push the button first or not, there will be a huge pressure on human commanders. So there are big, potentially huge negative impact which are still unpredictable. 
we want to make sure that those negative impact will not be there. Now, there is also discussions taking place on lethal autonomous weapon systems. These are autonomous weapon systems with or without artificial intelligence. The problem with lethal autonomous weapon systems, member states have been discussing this in Geneva for, for the past several years, um, to basically take a dual approach. They have been making progress. Number one, to prohibit those fully autonomous weapon systems, fully means once you put the button, there will be no human intervention, no human involvement in terms of the use of lethal force. Those weapons, member states agree, cannot be used in accordance with international humanitarian law. You know, humanitarian law has all the sort of, uh, you know, distinction, the proportionality, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so those, you know, indiscriminate nature, etc. So they say that fully autonomous weapon systems, they will be a category of weapon systems that cannot be used in accordance with IHL. Mm. They should be prohibited. And there will be other lethal autonomous weapon systems that could be used, still be used in accordance with IHL. Those should be regulated. So this, that's a dual track approach. So that's a general approach that member states have arrived at. But in terms of a concrete progress from here, it's a little bit stalled. We don't know how fast they will move from here um, to the actual agreement, which is why the Secretary General made a very bold recommendation in the new agenda for peace and asked for UN member states to negotiate and conclude by 2026 a legally binding uh, agreement in these areas. Whether that will happen or not, we don't know yet. We think, I think it is still possible as long as there is a political will. Unfortunately, the big military powers will believe that uh, those countries or states that will have these kinds of weapons first will have a military upper, upper hand. So they are very cautious about being regulated in these areas. So there is a lack of political well that I could see at the moment. And there is still no agreed technical definition of what is lethal autonomous weapon system. So uh, if these th two things are uh, overcome, I do think it is still possible. There is a general agreement mm. that these should not be. I mean, Secretary General has been taking a very strong position, he said, already in 2018, I think, um, the idea of machines um, killing, um, you know, taking human life uh, without human involvement is uh, repugnant and it should be prohibited by international law. So that's our view. And then obviously the uh, uh, regulations uh, tend, in my view, uh, it might not be the correct view, uh, it tends to be easier to do for maybe member states than non-state actors. Of course, you have the extreme uh, uh, terrorists that you can easily identify, but also non-state actors that you don't really know what they are, and mm -hmm. they have weapons, and, they are, and they, some of them are using it. So given the fact that uh, these new technological developments are reducing the cost and increasing the access to some of these technologies. How do we encourage this armament, especially for those private uh, organizations, non-state actors? This is a really important and, and very difficult question, and it's actually at the center of, of the issue. And the reason is, you know, unlike, let's say, uh, nuclear technology, I mean, uh, as you said, it's diffused. I mean, access to those technologies is much easier, mm. and, and therefore it's much more difficult to regulate. Um, I think there are um, several different dimensions. Number one, the development or innovation of those technologies itself will need to be much more carefully done with 
standards created with a, a kind of an oversight that is created so that they will be a much better understanding of the consequences of a certain technology. That's one. And by the way, the technologies themselves are not state-driven development, but those are actually done by private sector. So that's also you know, a, a dimension. The use of those technologies in a malicious way, again, there are many different dimensions. I mean, on the one hand, as you mentioned, there is the actual use of weapons. You know, for example, um, small, small arms with a, um, a 3D printer technology, um, rather than actually regulating them through the transfer, it will become much more difficult because potentially in the near future, um, different private sector or, or you know, non-state actors will be able to produce the, those weapons um, you know, much more easily using 3D. Um, so in order to regulate those things, we need to make sure that the governments will have a, um, um, appropriate and sufficient capabilities to regulate mm. um, under the framework of the law enforcement uh, mm. capacities. So it's, uh, it's many different dimensions and this is very difficult because in the areas of disarmament, how to verify that some, some regulation is actually fulfilled and functioning is a key issue. Mm. And verifying, for example, um, AI area uh, will be quite a challenge because it's it's an enabling technology. It's not like a, a tangible technology like like the nuclear technology. So um, it's a challenge, um, and and so it's a full of challenge, um, which is why the Secretary General also made a very quite quite bold recommendation. And this actually came from himself, not from me, uh, or the Tech Envoy. He is calling for a creation of uh, an a AI agency mm -hmm. that will maximize the peaceful uses of AI technology, mm -hmm. but at the same time mitigate and regulate mm -hmm. the malicious use side. Mm -hmm. So we are now starting to think about what might be, you know, various options to, to, to do this task using um, experiences from IAEA, Nuclear technology, as I mentioned many times, is very different from AI, so I don't think it will be mm. like IAEA, uh, but we need to look at also how IPCC has played mm. a, a scientific role in moving the climate uh, discussions mm. to this point. Some people say that ICAO model is also quite interesting, so we need to make sure that various past experiences of international community to tackle those new challenges mm might feed in, but my sense is that this regulation will have to be done in a very creative way. None of the existing models will fit neatly. Before I open uh, the floor for questions, uh, we have many young people and students in our audience today. What advice do you have, uh, especially to those young people who are interested in a career in disarmament uh, or working for the UN system? Thank you. I mean, it's, um, you know, involving young people, um, we don't, I mean, we are prioritizing it, but we don't say that just for lip service. Um, it's an actual need, and the reason is, as I mentioned, security landscape has changed dramatically and will continue to evolve and change dramatically. And, and therefore, the disarmament approaches that we have been taking um, needs to also evolve and change with it. And young people who actually have uh, expertise and understandings on, on these new phenomena uh, can really bring interesting um, uh, perspectives. So I hope that they will, um, there will be many students, many young people mm. who would take an active interest in international security issues and disarmament. My advice is that take a, a broad look at those issues. I emphasize always that disarmament is not on the base, it's not an ideological issue. It's not an idealistic, utopian um, um, you know, issue. It is about security. So you need to actually learn 
the various mm. um, aspects of international security, including military, including science and technology, um, including, I would say, you know, how um, deterrence theories work or not work, the shortcomings of it, um, and um, uh, take a, a interest in, in, in those security issues mm. with a firm conviction that disarmament helps to increase security. So that's my, and then, you know, connect with um, um, various young people from the world. Um, networking helps. Um, and um, UNODA has many initiatives in this regard, including the new initiative that was um, started by Prime Minister Kishida, um, the Youth um, um, Leadership Fund for Nuclear Disarmament, uh, with $10 million um, contributed by the government of Japan. Um, and, um, and I hope that they will get involved um, and actively in involved and, and with passion. Uh, th thank you very much, Arigato Gonzaimashita. I think let's uh, give uh, USG Nakamitsu a round of applause. Thank you.